Davis is waiting in the wing. Well, in the words of Jimi Hendrix, I see that we meet again. Hmm. <laughs> ah, well, uh, yeah, that's from Woodstock. But uh, what I'm going to do tonight is talk about Portland's punk scene, 1979, 1980, 81, and uh, the clubs that were around because there was not, you know, a whole bunch of clubs that allowed you to play your own music. And um, the way the club scene was back then, Pacific Talent, Andy Gilbert's booking agency, would book the most of the taverns, like my set I owned 16 of them. Beckman's Place was one, and then down the street from my house, No Dogs Allowed, which was not my set brothers. But one day, Bill Hoffman and I were riding through the parking lot, and we, uh, on our bikes, I think it was like 12 years old. And we saw this U-Haul truck. No, it was a rider. It was yellow. I remember that. Yellow truck and these guys that looked like rock stars that had long hair and they were carrying gear in. And we stopped and talked to them and thought, cool, man. And so we came back that weekend and we had sit in the parking lot and listened to the bands inside and if we got hungry, we'd go to Poncho's restaurant. And the first time we went to Poncho's restaurant, which uh, this is before my mom worked there, we thought this, she's a really gorgeous waitress, Lori. And she kept bringing us chips and salsa. And I kept thinking, hey, she really likes us, man. She's bringing us all this free stuff. I didn't realize that they give everybody... Free chips and salsa all night long. So we go and you could buy a taco for a dollar fifty and a milkshake for a dollar. So we'd go in there and have a milkshake and a taco and go back out and listen to the bands. They started at nine, so we'd go early, eat and get revved up for the <laughs> the gig, the parking lot gig. And I kept going back every Tuesday night. Tuesday afternoon is when they loaded in. And uh, one band told me, oh, all the groups load in on Tuesdays. And I read an article in Circus Magazine that said, how to be a roadie. And I thought, okay, cool. And they were talking about, you know, Paramounts and uh, theaters like that. Because that's where the concerts were back then. They didn't do arenas yet. Not like they do now. I remember when they uh, switched from the Paramount, which was like $2 to $4, to the Coliseum, which was 6 bucks, And the sound was horrible. <laughs> it's just a big cement room. The Paramount actually is acoustically awesome. It sounds perfect. And I've been on the stage once at a full jam-packed Paramount Theater, 1993. It was a Schnitzer, Arlene Schnitzer concert all. But um, I saw my friend who worked at Double T, and I was at a Robin Trower concert at the Starry Night. And she said, I got to go. I can't talk. I got to go. I got to go do the count out for George Clinton or where? And she said, the sense. I said, oh, man, I'd love to go. I love that guy. And she said, you're in. Just go to the back door. But give me 15 to 20 minutes and then show up. Everything will be paid for you. And I'd seen Robin Trower once before that uh, this, that week and uh, – Mad at me is kind of cool. They left him outside in the rain, <laughs> and it was summertime. But uh, anyway, Buko and I, no, we drove, right. He, had, he, was, he was driving. We uh, drove to the Paramount, go to the door, and I say my name. I go, Matt McCourt. Oh, Mr. McCourt, we're waiting for you. I thought, wow. And Jessica was the woman's name, in case you were wondering, because everybody knew Jessica. And we go backstage, and there's a huge party. We're the only white people back there. 
and severely dressed like shit compared to everyone else in their awesome suits. And they looked, oh, man, they just were dressed to the nines. There was a full-on party going on side of the stage, backstage, during the George Clinton and uh, Funkadelic show. Then I'm standing on the side of the stage, and George locks eyes with me and walks over, and he puts his arms out and gives me a bear hug and pulls me in and starts walking back to center stage. I thought, okay, fun. This is awesome. And he spins me around with a big wave of his hand, big sweep of his hand. He goes, he didn't say anything. Just, it was just like, enjoy this, man. Dig this. And so I started dancing. And I was on stage for a long time, going to each band member. And I was up on the drums, hitting the drums. And it was great, man. And he pointed. I heard the crowd go, yeah, I guess George must have motion for him to give me a round of applause. He comes by, grabs me again, and does like this, like, time to go. So he waltzes me off stage and goes back and tells the bartender, give him anything he wants, whatever he wants. I thought, wow. And he smiled at me and went back on stage. The guy in the, the diaper and the wedding dress came over <laughs> also. And they both, oh man, that was so awesome. I always wanted to be on stage at the Paramount. And that place was packed, all the balconies. Anyway, I digress. So uh, concerts were at the Paramount Theater in Portland. I saw Candy Heat my first time. I was 11 years old. I went with Bill Hoffman. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? And hi, Bob Sattenberg. How are you? That's the engineer from Recording Associates who recorded Wild Dogs, Guitar Slim and the Blue Balls, Mayhem, Evil Genius, Poison Idea, and a number of other bands that uh, I've been associated with. And I produced there also. But back to the club scene in Portland. It was either the Andy Gilbert Clubs, which played set lists that they kind of help you make your own set list of cover bands. And at first, with No Dogs Allowed, it was all bands from Seattle. There's no local bands. I think Legend with Doug Rowell was the first Portland band to play in No Dogs Allowed. Uh, and, oh, yeah, Morning After with uh, Eric Barnett. And Walt Van Reen was the manager. And he's also the manager of Jet, who became movie star and a number of other groups along the way. I actually gave him my handwritten letter to try to audition for Jet when Barry Bendegrass left. No, it was when Danny Kurth left, actually. <laughs> and uh, hi, Barry. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Thanks for liking my posts and stuff and Cat's Rule. So, uh... I spent a lot of time at No Dogs Allowed, so by the time I got old enough, I started playing my own original music. There were there's only one club, The Long Goodbye, owned by Tony DiBacoli, and Rob Sample took me down to Long Goodbye. Not long after we recorded my first two songs, Full Color Woman, and Changed My Life, and he took me down there. I was like 19, and they got me in. And Ty North, the first night I was there, Ty North, who was married to Roger North, the guy who designed those drums that look like big uh, horn things. Uh, she was such a sweet lady. She gave me mashed potatoes and gravy. And uh, I got to know her better later on. And it was really an awesome thing. Nice people. And Tony DiMacoli was very cordial, and they didn't seem to worry about the OLCC like they do now. I didn't get ID'd, just walked in and saw, I can't remember, I think the Balloons, the band called the Balloons, and I think the Odds. 
with Dwayne Jarvis, who played with the Motels later on. And uh, I thought, this is home to me, man. I found my place. I got to put a band together because I got to jam that night with the band, which was unheard of in the other cover clubs. It was all union. You had to be in the union to play the clubs, and uh, you got paid quite. I mean, cover bands were getting like $3,000 a week. You bring your own PA and lights, and you play five hours a night, and uh, it was good money. But long goodbye, I could play my own stuff, and no problem. I got a band together called Rude Awakening with Dave Phillips and Bill Mountain on bass and started playing there every week. Along with that, God, we played a, a frat party in U of O. We all put all the gear in my Cadillac. My grandma died and left me money, so I bought a Cadillac. My mom's friend husband took me out looking for cars and he said, you don't want this tiny piece of crap. Let's go look at a Cadillac. I go, okay. And you can haul all your band gear in there, which I hadn't done before. So <laughs> that was a fun band, man. We played all kinds of places. The Inn of the Key. But we played mostly at the Long Goodbye. And then another club owned by Fred Sigmuller, who worked at Music Millennium forever, and his wife, Ronnie Noyes. Uh, I had a crush on Ronnie. She's super cute. But they had a club called Urban Noise. The first one was on the back side of the block where Andy and Bax is. It was a, a dance studio, I think, or a dance. People danced. <laughs> I mean, like, they taught dancing. And... I played there quite a bit, actually, and that and then they closed. They got a different location. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, that year we played at uh, the uh, Imperial Roller Rink, which is now a soccer club on Grand or MLK, whatever they call, or Union, by the Hawthorne Bridge. It was, it was a big marathon concert to raise money for something. But I used a Univox One Twelve. Solid state amp, and uh, it was awesome. I th I realized then you don't need a giant amp; you could just play with this. So, uh, Urban Noise Number Two was on right about Knot and MLK, up in when the hood was really the hood. And if you're a white guy, it was not the place to be if you didn't know somebody. Luckily, I went to school with a lot of people that everybody knew. But we show up, and uh, it was like a like one of those black urban uh, nightclubs, or uh, you know, kind of like a private club, and it was pretty cool, man. I saw Johnny Thunders there. We didn't play. I, I don't think we played with them. I can't remember. I remember going to that show, and because everybody, everyone was like, "Oh, Johnny Thunders, man! Johnny Thunders is—he's the best. He's the greatest." And you show up. Johnny can't go on stage until he gets his heroin, and so we wait for a good hour and a half because nobody does heroin in Portland at that time, 1981. And uh, they have to find some pimp outside Big Cadillac and track him down and ask him, hey, do you know where to get some heroin? We've got a guy from New York. That... So anyway, he doses up, goes on stage, and they they play a, a surf song. I can't remember. It's not Wipeout. It was uh, something else. Adventure song, I think, and the uh, oh, Pipeline. And the very first song, up front, they were kind of pogo dancing because moshing and, you know, slam dancing and pogo dancing was what was going on then, not mad moshing. But somebody bumped the microphone, and it was a Sure 57 
kind of the round cylinder will, and it hit the bass player's mouth and left an indentation of <laughs> looked like a circular saw on his face. He was not happy. He looked like a big New York Italian guy. And, I mean, he was pretty big. Johnny Thunders was horrible. I mean, just total crap. People, were, I was looking around people and other people looking around going, am I the only one who thinks this is total shit? And he was. He was horrible. <laughs> I thought, eh, uh, New York Dolls, they're all right, but I was a big fan. I'm not a big fan of Iggy Pop either. I like a few songs, but I rented a couple DVDs over in Selwood when I was over there a lot, and I just I like Iggy's Iggy as Iggy, but the music sucks. I kind of feel the same way about the MC5. They're good and loud and aggressive, but nah, I didn't like that too well. They're all right, you know. But uh, Joan Chap played at the Urban Noise, and my friend Janet Rocks which is very funny. Somebody that I work with at Port Community College lives on the same street. And I go, do you know Janet Rocks? And he goes, yeah. And I said, you know, the girl with the dog that's like five feet tall. Really, it was like some Irish wolfhound or something. But I came to her door. She was such a sweetest girl, the nicest woman ever. And the only person who ever offered to pay for any gas I go out. I live on south. You know, I live on the southeast, southwest side, and so I had to go clear out to North Portland, St. John's, and I pick her up, and she'd give me twenty dollars for gas. I thought, wow, man, I just love that woman. She's great. Hi, Janet, if you're watching. And I did a lot of stuff with her. In fact, she was my two of my friends' girlfriends for a while. Eric Frey, the, the drummer on my first stuff. Uh, later on, but first uh, she was Jerry Cottrell's girlfriend, and he had moved into her house over in uh, by Sandy Boulevard. And then later on, uh, she hooked up with my friend Eric and my ex-wife Angie. Not it's the only woman she just really liked her too. We'd go to her apartment downtown, get pizza and beer. She goes, "Come over, I'll, I'll get a pizza, bring some beer." And she waited. She said, "Beer." It was like she really pronounced both these beer, <laughs> or in German, yeah, the way it's supposed to say. Anyway, so we played at the Long Goodbye, and we played at the uh, Urban Noise, and they eventually had to close down because some of the people in the neighborhood didn't like all these punk rock and white guys in that place. I guess so. They, uh, I think, they nailed. Uh, German Shepherd to the front door. I think that's the story I heard, but that was done. And then the Metropolis. That was an all-ages gay club with an over-21 bar right next to it with a a glass so you could go in the bar and drink and look at the people on the other side. It was, you know, it was just all gay people, and it says right in the front door, it says, if you're not gay or this bothers you, this is not your place. And how we got the, our first gig, it's where Dante's is. There's a record store behind it back then. That's gone now, like everything else in Portland. And Chris Newman called me up and said, hey, Matt, because we were really good friends at that time. Hey, Matt. We got a gig at Metropolis, but we can't do it because we got a last-minute call to play with April Wine at the Paramount. I go, oh wow, that's cool. He goes, oh yeah, he wasn't too happy. I said, I'll take, I'll do that gig instead. No, he'll do it. So he uh, hands me the gig. We go down there, and our drummer Brad from the Ravers, he was a gay guy, and he had a good time, and I remember being the the first time they didn't want bands. It was like the first night bands were playing there. There was always, you know, like cross dressers who would lip sync, and 
Biddy Swine. Well, we had a lot of fun there. Tracy Harvey, that's where I met her. And, uh, yeah, we played it a, a number of times. We were called, we didn't have the name The Ravers yet. We were called The Penny Traders, P-E-N-I Traitors with a Z. <laughs> So it all fit, and I, I remember going into the bathroom, and the guy's bathroom, and there's a group of got kids. I mean, they're young. They're like, you know, underage, right, 13, 14, and they're all around this guy. On the, there's one kid sitting on the toilet, and somebody was giving him a blowjob. And I thought, wow, this is a swinging place. You never see this happen anywhere else. I thought, cool. I well, they looked at me and said, all right, carry on, and uh, went back outside. And on the dance floor, the dance floor, the dance floor, um, two of these most gorgeous girls I had seen in my life right then, and they were young. They were like 16, 17, all made up. I think they were models. But they had a dance floor that was like Saturday Night Fever, just like that. And I remember having to get up and play and watching these two girls dance together. And then pretty soon they were going down for a bit of oral on the dance floor. (laughs) Oral on the dance floor. Oral on the dance floral. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, it was a pretty wild thing. And Lanny, the guy who owned the joint, also owned... That hotel that's on same side of the street on Broadway, right by the Broadway Bridge. So he, that was a big party place afterwards. I used I worked on his cable access shows a number of times, along with the uh, what was her name? Oh, uh, Amanda, Amanda Paris. Yeah, something like that. But she had. Uh, drag queens and Debbie said go work on that show and see if she's a man or a woman and I go okay <laughs> don't have to twist my arm so I go there and Amanda Paris was a woman and but she had a show that had all drag queens and uh, they would go down there too so uh, it was crazy times man so uh, we played a lot of parties yeah, like uh, like I said, I <laughs> played a party out at that. Uh, there's some hall right by uh, Fred Myers on Johnson Creek Boulevard, and this place was on 82nd. And a girl, Happy Laird, that uh, I really had I had serious crushes on in high school. And she was there, and we kind of hooked up and went back to my house. And I, uh, it was, I think the whiskey was jealous of me and (laughs) incapacitated my ability to perform. Ed showed up (laughs) for the first time. So I get my big chance to go skiing, and nope. So she started hanging out with the band, and, uh, we practiced at her house, actually, in Tiger. That's where the song Spinning Baby came up because she kind of spun around to all the guys and Richard Carter, the uh, sound guy. But uh, at the Long and By, we played with the Odds, the Mouth Chicks, Balloons, the Rats that had Fred and uh, lots of Fred and his wife, different Fred and his wife, Fred you know, Fred from Tombstone and Tootie, Fred and Tootie. I remember having a gig with him, and uh, he called me up and said, Hey, Matt, we, we're we not going to make it, but the show is going to go on. Our drummer blew his brains out. I thought, oh, my God. So uh, we did that show, and, oh, yeah, lots, lots of gigs with uh, The Untouchables with Chris Newman. And he had a pink Stratocaster. And a flesh tone Marshall amp. I thought that was cool. The only other guy I knew that had a different color amp was Mick Zane from Malice, and he had a full stack. 
but um, I'd always smash a guitar. Colleen Thielen would buy me uh, like a copy guitar and say smash this because I was really into The Who at the time. Totally into Keith Moon and Pete Townsend. And so I smashed I, against the wall, the first one. Didn't realize it's just uh, sheetrock and damaged this nice painting. Oops. But Tony was cool. Tony, Hi, Tony. Thanks for giving me the start, man. I appreciate it. And uh, now I've got 48 albums out. I'm still in my mom's basement. <laughs> but uh, and I'm still rocking. So hopefully they found the footage. So let's play a little bit. And uh, well, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll do another story tomorrow. I'm Matt McCorp. You can visit usmetal.com if you want more information. And all the music is on. Spotify and iTunes and every download site. And also, I sell CDs. 24 of the 48 releases are on eBay and T-shirts also. So I'll talk about Recording Associates tomorrow, where we've recorded Wild Dogs, Mayhem, Poison Idea, uh, Pick Your King. I produced that one and, uh, and more. Okay? Thanks for watching. Have a good day.